It's all in a Bible class. Uh, you tend to find things that you don't normally uh, bring out. Uh, maybe if you're studying a character or a, a period of Bible history. So uh, I don't. I, I, I know that there have been, uh, in looking in the files back there, that there have been other times that this book has been studied, and I looked over that material, and uh, so my, my contextual approach uh, is, a, is different from either of those, so I'm, I was glad for that. It's not why I did it, but because like I say, everything I pretty much approach in Bible study or preaching is going to be... Uh, contextual uh, approach to it. So, uh, but I do hope you're enjoying the class, that you're benefiting from it, uh, that you uh, learn something maybe you haven't uh, thought about in the past. Uh, you know, things as far as why did God uh, curse the ground, or why was the ground cursed, and seeing the relationship of sin has caused all of this futility that we're reading about in this book. And, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be done away with in this life. But, you know, if we just take the view that, you know, this life is all that there is, there's not much reason to live, is there? There's no hope. People are not going to quit sinning. And uh, so... The reason to to live is not going to be realized in this life. It's, it's you know it's going to come in the next life, and that's why the end of the book talks about there's going to be a day of accounting. People may be getting away with, as we say a lot of times, using it figuratively. A lot of people just get away with murder, so to speak, not literally, but they just get by with doing wrong and doing wrong. And this chapter, chapter four talks about some of the many ways that uh, people just do wrong. There, there is uh, three or four things mentioned here, so we'll get into that in just a moment. So chapter 4 is where we're going to take up in your material. It's on page 16, okay? Page 16 of the material. Let's bow our heads and go to God in prayer. Our God and Father, we bow in submission and in recognition of your greatness and superiority to us. Yet we bow in confidence knowing that we are praying to a God that loves us more than we can understand fully. We recognize and honor you by acknowledging the care of this day as well as throughout our life. For the day's provisions that you've given us and above all for the hope of heaven that is a constant that anchors us through uh, all that we must go through in this life. We're thankful for the many sacrifices, not only of your Son, but for all those who have believed in him and his word, all the prophets that labored and suffered for his cause made it possible that truth has been passed down to us. We're thankful and express our thanks to you for that. Tonight, as we enter into this study again of teaching of wisdom and on trying to get a good grasp of life under the sun and putting things in perspective, we hope and pray that uh, we will take from this class some things that will help us through the, the trials and the storms of life, we might be reminded of why there is reason to press on and why it is beneficial to us to have our faith put to the test. And we pray for strength, especially in the hour of trial, that we might emerge faithful to you. And that doing and doing that, we might bring glory and honor unto you and to your name. We pray for all that are in the classes tonight. May we have a profitable hour of study. Bless us in 
our labors to spread the gospel and to edify one another that we might be ready and prepared for the return of our Savior in the near future. And we ask these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this chapter, chapter 4, there's, he mentions three things. Uh, well, actually he mentions four things. There's four subjects in this chapter. Uh, he opens up talking about oppression, doesn't he? Talks about people who are oppressed and this inequity of oppression. He says some things about those who do the oppressing and those who are being oppressed. That's kind of in the first three verses. Then verses four through six, another inequity of life because people choose to live apart from the way God purposed them to live. There's a lot of rivalry and competition that goes on about us, isn't there? And uh, then verses 7 through 12, you know, sometimes people just want to not have anything to do with that rat race of a life, and they just kind of become hermits. And so he talks about isolation. Is that good? Just withdraw yourself from everybody and just try to, I'll live by myself. You know, there are, uh, segments of society or certain peoples that kind of keep to themselves. So he talks about that in verses 7 through 12, uh, showing, uh, contrasting that with how that there is strength in something else. Then he closes in the chapter in, from verse 13 on, talking about popularity. Does it last very long? So why bother trying, you know, to... So those are the four things. Oppression, rivalry, isolation, and popularity. How do these things fit into uh, life here under the sun? So let's begin by looking, first of all, and reading these first three verses. He says, Then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done, under the sun. Behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed. They had no one to comfort them. Power was on the side of their oppressors. But they had no one to comfort them. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. What are these acts of oppression referring to, class? I don't know, anything that might oppress a Christian is persecution. Is persecution classified? Would you put that under the heading of obedience or disobedience? These acts of oppression, we're talking about sin, just in short, and certainly persecution. That's not what we're to do as Christians. We suffer it. It goes on. But uh, we're simply, we're talking about uh, the sin of uh, one person or one someone who really this chapter as I looked at back over it and looked at it more deeply you know God has instituted a lot of relationships he's instituted government he's instituted marriage that relationship and in all of these areas you know he, we have the home we have the, the the home, the government, the church, uh, marriage, all of these things are areas in which God has given someone authority, hasn't he? Someone has authority in government. Someone has authority in, there's authority that's purposed and placed in the home. There's authority in the church. It's, it's delegated authority. But all of these areas are areas where justice should go forth. 
What did the Apostle Paul say in Romans 13 about government? It's set up for what reason? To administer justice. But yet, the author here talks about as he looks around, and we can look around today, it, does justice flow from government? God set up the home. Parents have a responsibility. These areas of responsibility, parents should raise their children, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, shouldn't they? Do they? Is there any abuse? Have you ever heard of abuse in the home? It's rare not to. So these areas that God, like the times, these appointed times that we just studied in chapter 3, these are appointed positions of responsibility. God gave you responsibility as an individual to do what the end of this book says. Fear Him. He gave you a mind. He gave you a will. He gave you the capability of making the right choice, a wise choice. Why don't you? Anytime the wrong choice is made by an individual, by a government, by parents, some form of oppression is going to result. This is what he's talking about. There is the denial of justice and righteousness because of these acts of oppression. We read in many places about this, what he's opened up with here in verse 1 of chapter 4. He had... He had just the chapter that we just finished studying back in verse 16. He mentioned that he saw in the place of justice, what did he see? Wickedness and un... Uh, there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, he saw wickedness. If you look ahead to chapter 5 and verse 8, what does he say there? He again says... If you see the oppression of the poor and the denial of justice, don't be shocked. And so this oppression can come in that form in chapter 7 and verse 7. He's again, we're going, when we get to those chapters, what does he say about oppression in chapter 7 and verse 7 of Ecclesiastes? A bribe corrupts the heart. And in chapter 8 and verse 9, talked about a man who exercised authority over another man to his hurt. So, I as a husband, I have authority over Fern. I'm not to use that to abuse her. I'm to do it, I'm to use it, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5. I'm to love her as I would love my own body. I'm to love her as Christ loved the church. And when I don't do that, I'm exercising my authority to her hurt. And I'm exercising my authority to my hurt. These, this is what he's talking about here in chapter 4. Now, on those that are oppressed, we might look at another aspect if you'll turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter here is writing to Christians. And he's talking about oppression. He's talking about oppression as Christians that we undergo. Beginning in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange things were happening to you. But to the, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, 
keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, what are you? Blessed. Blessed. Because the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. By no means let any of you suffer or undergo oppression as a murderer, thief, evildoer, or troublesome meddler. But, verse 16, if you are oppressed because you are a what? Don't be ashamed, but in that name glorify God. So, there is oppression, and there is another form of oppression. What are we to do when we're oppressed for the right reason? We are to rejoice. We are to take joy in that. Now, Ecclesiastes, we've already been introduced about finding joy in this life. We each of us need to ask ourselves regularly, do I rejoice when I'm persecuted because of my stand for truth? Does that cause me to rejoice? Or am I going to do what we're going to read about here? Do I I, I'm not going to I'm not going to subject myself to that. And I'm sure that uh, Jason's going to deal with that in his evangelism classes. If you withdraw because you don't want to deal with it, are you going to be evangelistic, Jason? If you're going to do evangelism, you're going to be subjected to this, what Peter said. Now how devoted are you to the gospel message that saved you. You look at all the people that were persecuted for that. So he's talking about this in verses 1 through 3. And in verse 1, he talks about the tears of those who are oppressed with no one to comfort them. Uh, He mentioned this also uh, Uh, Let's see, let's look at a few passages here. Michael, will you turn to Exodus 23, verse 8? Jason, uh, well, obviously Fern, you get Deuteronomy 16, 19. Deuteronomy 16, 19. Jason, Proverbs, uh, two verses in chapter 17, verse 8 and 23. Meredith, would you get Micah 3, verse 11? Aaron, Micah 7, verse 3. Okay, Michael, Exodus 23, 8. And you shall not take a bribe, for a bribe is blind to the clear side and subverts the cause of the judge. What does a bribe do? This is why there is oppression. And it does what else, Michael, in that verse? This is what a bribe does. Uh, Fern, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 19, please. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. And you shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Why do, why does someone seek to bribe someone else? What's their motive? Generally self-interest because they've already fallen short of the mark. It's not an honorable act, is it? You're usually trying to cover up a wrong or escape judgment, escape justice. Uh, The people that are normally approached for a bribe are usually someone that is in need of 
And so they are a prey, they are the victim that's preyed upon. Uh, it'd be like uh, if uh, you were an alcoholic, you didn't have money for booze, I can bribe you pretty easy. What am I going to do? Offer you money that you can buy what? I just need you to tell a little white lie for me. Justice is perverted. This is what it does. Okay, uh, Proverbs 17, verse 8 and 23. So that first verse, verse 8, in the person's eyes, he really thinks, because I can bribe, this is like a charm. It will, it will work my magic. And then the person on the receiving end in verse 23, again, you see, always in the Bible, bribes are connected and associated with the perversion of justice. Micah 3.11 People's mindset is, because I can't see it, who else can't see it? God does not see. And in chapter 7 and verse 3 of Micah, But they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe, and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. This is what's done. This is... This how this oppression works. Two people get together to concoct, and usually it's in the place again where justice, such as from a judge, a lawyer, the, these folks are in these jobs to administer justice, to, to enforce the law. So often what happens? Just the opposite. And the people that are rendered as that, that is their victim, they know that there's no way that they can stop them. There's no way that they can expose them. You know? This is what he's talking about. So he says, I saw the tears of those that are oppressed. No one to comfort them. Power was on the side of the oppressor. And it's interesting how you look at uh, the latter part. Uh, I always, when I'm reading and studying with someone, I tell them the importance of a pronoun. When you're studying on your own and you come across a pronoun, be sure to find out who the antecedent is. Now here, he sees the tears of who? And that's who this day is referring to. But then he talks about the oppressors. What does he say about the oppressors? Is that who this is referring to? Neither one of them, the oppressed or the oppressor, has no one to comfort them. You ever think about that? Someone who's doing the oppressing, who can comfort them? Who can say, man, I'm with you. You did a great job. No, they've done wrong. They've committed sin. Who's going to? And so there's misery. There's misery. Now, if there was just life here on earth, what he says in verses 2 and 3, that's why he says it. Because of that, you're better off the dead are better off. They, they, they no longer are subjected to this. And even better than that, in verse 3, it had been better if you'd never existed. Now there's a lot of people in the Bible that were so oppressed that they made these statements. You recall Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 when Jezebel made the threat? 
He said, I wished I'd never been born. You've got Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 3. He was so distraught. He said, I, I wished I'd never been born. People can get to that point because of the injustice that's going on about us. Why? Here's, here's the lesson for us. Why do we not take that path in life? Because at the end of the book, there's going to be a day of judgment coming. There's going to be a day of righting all this wrong. So, when these things go on, that doesn't mean that it's hopeless. Now let me ask you some more questions that was in the material. There's acts of oppression that goes on every day. Has been since Adam and Eve sinned. And Cain murdered Abel. Do these, does the prevalence of, these, of this sin have any effect upon God's appointed times? They're going to change what God says. This is how it's going to be. No, it doesn't. From what perspective does the author say then it's better off if you never existed? And again, Job spoke similar words. He says, I wish I'd never seen the light of day. We're going to read this again in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 3. And Jesus also mentioned in Luke chapter 23 of a time when men would say it would be better if... What did Jesus, what was he talking about? If you've read, looked at this verse in Luke 23, 29, what was Jesus talking about? Someone who would do that, oppress and, and mistreat. And specifically, if you notice what he's talking about here uh, in Luke 23, to show how severe it is. In Luke 23 and verse 29, He was talking about here, uh, this is right after Simon had been, you know, he's, Jesus is carrying his cross and Simon has been compelled to help him. And there was a multitude of people uh, and of women in verse 27 that were following, mourning and lamenting what was happening to Jesus. And Jesus turns to them and he says, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. You better weep for yourself and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. They will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. What's Jesus talking about? It's going to become so severe, the persecution, that you will wish that your life could end. This is how bad it can get. But, uh, so what's the perspective that he talks about it's better off? Is it actually true that because sin exists, you and I and all mankind from Adam and Eve to us, because men have turned wicked for the most part, would we be better off to have never been created? Not at all. I mean, if we weren't created, then we wouldn't have the, the, the little influence that we could have on other people to lead them to Jesus. And what would we what, what would we not know now that we're here? What awaits us? You know, would, it, would we be better off to have never known God? Do we, you know, this is what Malachi dealt with. Do we, and maybe not verbally, but have we thought along the lines of, I wish God had just never made me? Have we got that miserable, ever been that miserable in our life that we, we question, why did you make me, God? 
Why did you put me here? This is too hard of a life. Why must I be subjected to this? Again, we've talked about in previous classes, people that make the statement, why doesn't God take evil away from us and let us live in peace and in joy and in happiness? Can we not live, can we not live that way? Even though there's sin? So does everyone understand at least this point One oh one, mute your phone. <laughs> I apologize. I thought I did. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's, it, I'm not excusing it, but this young man I've known for many years, he is, how would you say, he's very mentally challenged. And he is, he regards us as some of the, probably the only, some of the few people that have not abused him. Uh, he attended Mill Street. He, he's just, we've kept in contact, so you know, he doesn't understand what we're, where, where we're at tonight. But I apologize for that. But I want to get this point across if I get nothing else tonight. Would we have been better off for God never to have made us? I hope you can say no. To have never come into existence is not anything to compare with being here and now having God reveal Himself to me and find out what a great being He is and what He has prepared for me and to learn of what love he had for me. How can I say, because of the oppression, I wished I'd never been born. It's worth it. It's worth it. Jesus came and took our sins. That makes life worthwhile. So let's remember that. As we move on, in reality, are the things that are said to be better off, if actually better off? Uh, I think we've touched upon that enough. Any other comments or questions through verse 3? Let's read on. He gets in now to the second part of this chapter. He's going to talk about the rivalries that, that go on. I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a person and his neighbor. This too is futility and striving after win. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. One hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after the wind. What does he mean by this term here? What are we talking about? Some versions may have another word other than rivalry. Envy. We're talking about envy and jealousy. This is what we're talking about. I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of envy. This is what goes on most of the time. Someone who does something that is honorable, uh, if Brad is successful, I sulk because I'm envious that he's getting attention. And it's what, we, we, we see kids do this. Let me tell you something. Adults do it ten times more than kids do. And they do it in an oppressive manner. 
It's the behavior that we see out of King Saul when David got more popularity. How did he act? How did he react? Was he glad for David? Was he happy for David? This is what we're talking about. It's what caused Cain to kill Abel. Jealousy, envy. He didn't like the fact that Abel found acceptance with God. And what resulted? So, what spoils earthly endeavor according to verse 4? Envy, jealousy, this rivalry. Some people take the approach being so frustrated that no matter what I do, somebody is going to do what to me? Either accuse me of I climbed to the ladder by sleeping my way there or I was dishonest. You know, we should be, man should be thankful when some other man by honorable means is successful. If you raise your kids good, should I resent that? This is what he's talking about. Man can be as cruel and inhuman to each other through unnecessary competition as much as they can in oppression. People can be very cruel when success is greeted with envy. Somebody is harmed. Someone is hurt. Someone suffers. So, according to verse 5, some people, because of that, they begin to reason, why should I break my back at being successful when all I'm going to do is have some injustice done to me? So what do they do? They take that pendulum. They're, instead of being a workaholic, what do they become? Pardon? Yeah, they become idle. They become idle. And that's what he's talking about. But if you do that, Barry, the author said you're a what? That's not the answer. So you avoid both extremes. There is this happy medium. And he explains it in verse 6 as this. A handful of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after the wind. That is worded this way in Proverbs chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with treasure. Better is a portion of vegetables where there is love than a fatted ox served with hatred. That's Proverbs 15, verses 16 and 17. And then in Proverbs 16, verse 8, he said, Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. So he says, Don't do this, but don't do this. It's better to have a hand full of rest. Live godly. Do things honestly. That is the best way to do things. As we go on to our questions. Number two, is a fool who will not work, does he have any advantage over someone who is a workaholic? No. No, there's, no, there's no advantage. So what's the benefits here from a, script, from a spiritual standpoint? 
And it's seen here in verse 6. What's better than this? What he said there in Proverbs chapter 15 and 16. The prophet Isaiah on, on question number 3. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 21, he mentioned that of Israel, he said, they will pass through the land dejected and hungry, and it will turn out that when they're hungry, they will become enraged and curse their king and curse God as they face upward. This is what a lot of people do. In their misery, rather than turn to God, which is what he wants, they blame everybody else, and they even blame God. It's funny when people are on hard times. Have you ever heard anybody blame Satan? Oh, I hate Satan. He's, he just made my life miserable. Who do they blame? Why has God, why does God, there's no kids in here, you ever heard Satan, D-A-M, blank? We never hear that phrase. It's always God. Why do we never hear Satan? This is what man has become. But I hope you see, I know the class is winding up tonight, and uh, we're going to uh, take up with verse 7. Uh, you can mark next week. But uh, what did you learn? out of tonight's discussion. Good thing, Roger, that you know, it, was, it, was a bit of the, it was a bit of the homework that you gave us, you know, that, that question about a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Um, to me, that, that applies especially to chapter 4. I mean, when we're talking about brothers, I don't, I'm not, in my mind, I'm not considering that flesh, uh, physical brother, I'm talking spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, as a friend, so a friend, a brother, spiritually, a friend spiritually speaks, speaks closer than a physical blood brother. Uh, during these hard times, we have somebody to pick us up to encourage us when we're down and, our, down and out and on our knees or on our face, we've got somebody to do a reality check with us and yeah. help us to, to see that and to remind us that our hope is not, not here with all this junk that goes on, but to help us to refocus, to, to reignite that zeal. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that here in, our, in this five-minute span. I think the best example of that friend that's closer than a brother, I think of Jonathan to David. They were not related. But what drew them to one another? What was both of them what was both of them's goal in life? Did they fear God? And they supported each other. They were drawn to each other because of each other's godly approach to life and desire to uh, at least at that point in their life, you know, because we know certainly David just like Solomon, he, he, he wavered from that. But at that point in his life, Jonathan was drawn to him and he, he supported David going against his own dad because he knew his dad was in the wrong. And he proved himself a friend to David. He was that support, that comfort to David uh, until he died. And I think it was, you know, we don't read so much of what David did for Jonathan, but certainly after Jonathan was dead, David showed favor to the house of Saul. And I think that is definitely connected to uh, David's love and respect for Jonathan when he uh, 
took, uh, did what he did for Ishbosheth. I believe that's who it was. Anything else from tonight? What about being better off dead and never have existed? Does that, does that touch your heart at all? Is that worth enduring troubles and trials, temptations? Is heaven worth that?